Welcome to Holiday Park Life, a new podcast dedicated to the great British holiday park industry. As former holiday park employees, we've seen it all, and now we're going to discuss it all. Join us now as we pull back the curtain on our personal stories and adventures, speak to special guests and give helpful tips and insights into holiday park life. So here we are. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the podcast. Welcome to the show. It is the Mackham and the Mank. It's me, Ross, the Mackham, and it's Lee, the Mank. Say hello, Lee. Hello, everyone. You all right? Good, 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 good stuff. Are you doing good, mate? Yeah, I'm doing amazing. You know, sun's out. Guns out. Sun's but, out, guns out. You bit like he's been, no he's can been see working it. out. You can't see, but he's got guns of steel here. You better get a vet, Lee. Them swans are sick. Uh, welcome back to the show, everybody. Holiday Park Life. We're talking about all things Holiday Park Life and everything to do with it. We're going in depth and we're going behind the scenes. We're pulling back the curtain on the British holiday park industry. As you already know, me and Lee have spent many, many moons working for the holiday parks and we had a great time. Met each other there and became friends for life. Uh, so we've got our first guest on. It's exciting, isn't it, Lee? Oh, it's very exciting. It really is. Very exciting, a very good friend of ours. We spent a, a lot of time with this lad. Actually, we were almost a thruple, weren't we? It was like the three musketeers. Yeah, he was my next next door but two neighbour. He was my next door neighbour, so I've top trumped you on that one. <laughs> and, and we had wrestling matches together. I know me and you had a few wrestling matches, but me and Lee, me and... Yeah. So it might get confusing, because our guest is called Lee as well, but it's Lee with a, with a GH, so he's definitely more posh than you. The difference <laughs> is, though, that our, our wrestling was um, clothed. That's the difference. <laughs> Yeah. Well, when we're young, <laughs> we're trying a few things out. There's no show in that. So, uh, listen, let's bring Lee in. We're, we're talking to Lee Hughes today. Uh, Lee was the leisure manager for the holiday park that we used to work at together many, many moons ago. Uh, we met, I believe it was 2002, a long time ago. Lee, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks both. Hi, everybody. Good to see you, mate. It's good to see you. Good to hear from you. It's been you a long too. Time. So you're keeping well? Are you doing okay? How's things, the, the old coronavirus scenario, we're all in lockdown? How's things been working out for you? Are you working? What are you doing? What are you up to? Yeah, pretty good. So I'm working at the minute, working from home. So I'm on to, in, into my third month now. Um, getting used to it. It can be quite difficult working from home. But do you know what? It's been good to, to kind of spend some time at home as well. So yeah, holding up pretty well. Good stuff. Good to hear good to hear and uh, so obviously when when we first met it was a, a quite a long time ago quite a number of years ago now we met on the the famous holiday park in Blackpool that we've uh, the aforementioned park that we all worked on together Um I was on yep. entertainment uh, Lee, Lee Hargreaves well, we'll just call him the monk for this episode Lee the monk was uh, <laughs> the out, he loved that the outdoor activities and pursuits uh, and Lee tell us about your job what was your job at the park yeah, so uh, I joined in 98 um, on the leisure team. I did five seasons, and I think in my third season, I became the leisure manager. Uh, I think I uh, took over from a girl called Lindsay. She moved departments. So, so yeah, kind of various things, really. Just managing uh, quad bikes, um, climbing, rifle shooting, um, snooker games room. Yeah, it was really good. Really, really good time. So actually not a million miles away from some of the stuff that uh, the monk was doing because he was... Well, he, technically he was my boss on site because obviously I was um, working for a third party contractor. So my reporting line would have been straight into Lee. So, you know, I have to be careful what I say now because he was my boss. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you did report to me for a year or so, but yeah. I, didn't do, I didn't do any of the climbing or anything like that. I didn't have them skills. Left that all up to, up to you guys. So you you were more comfortable having a game of snooker? Having a game of snooker, yeah, and giant Jenga. <laughs> giant Jenga. And that used to be our team, team meetings. That's what the, Lee used to ring me and say, yeah, we've got a meeting, and I'd go down with playing snooker and, and giant Jenga and giant Connect Four. That's it, yeah, yeah. Good so, days, really, really good days. So you did like five seasons working on the holiday parks. So you've obviously yep. got, met a lot of people, worked with a lot of people, a lot of memories, a lot of stories. Can you remember like your interview? Can you remember the, the thought process? And did you see a job advertised and you thought that's for me? Like, how did you initially go, right, I'm going to go and work at a holiday park? Tell us, tell us about that. Okay, so the story, it's a bit of, a, bit of a good, an interesting story, actually. So Mark, one of my good friends from Coventry, he actually got a job 
at the Holiday Park before me. This was in 1998. Mm -hmm. And he was up there for about six weeks. And I got a phone call from him one day saying, Lee, there's a job on the Holiday Park. Do you want it? I said, mm -hmm. oh, that, that sounds good, but give me a few days to think about it. He said, the only thing is you need to be up here on Saturday. And right. I think it was like the Thursday that he phoned me. Wow. So I'd finished all my college work, doing everything that I needed to do. Um, went up there on a Saturday, didn't have an interview, spoke with the manager. And yeah, he said, right, you can start. So <laughs> no interview or anything. <laughs> oh so what did God. you do for your first day? What, what actually was your first day in sailing then? So I think... My friend Steve was just introducing me to people, got to know the site, kind of where my accommodation would be, um, which, yeah, was interesting, to say the least. But, yeah, it was just kind of getting to know the site, meeting the people that I was going to be working with, which a lot turned out to be very good friends uh, in the future. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of what my first day entailed. So I guess you had like not really any expectations and thrown in at the deep end. I think it's funny now, like talking about that, the fact that you you were going to go and do a job working with the public, working with kids, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> like that was what it was like then. You're talking like t over yeah. tw 20 years ago now, somebody would just take you on a personal recommendation from a friend that, that was there and they'd go, oh, yeah, he's a good guy. And that's how a lot of people started on these parks. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, the, the, the funny thing is, my friends got the sack two months after I joined. And then I, I, stay, I stayed there for five years, well, five seasons. So when you said about your accommodation, we've touched on that oh, on a previous podcast. And um, we referred to them as sheds, if you remember back yeah. then. Um, yeah. Was that phrase in place when you first joined? Or can you remember where it came from? No, 100%. It was, a, yeah, definitely. They called them sheds then. Just remember having to climb over the taps to get in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Oh my god! Tripping we, over on the taps. We, oh yeah, wow! We, it was funny because we were talking about the lad. Yeah, uh, I can't remember if he worked for the man or if he worked for you, Lee. But um, he was called Steve. He's from Blackpool. He was a young lad, and we. Um, I think we were having a kick about, and we told the story uh, a couple of weeks ago where. He went and asked for, remember them shower head attachments that used to be floating around so you could it would turn your bath into a shower? <laughs> yeah. You know, do you remember this story? Were you I, d I, I don't remember this specific story, but I remember, I know the shower head things that you're talking about. Yeah, well, um, Steve had went on his first day and asked Lee Hargreaves, asked him if there was any way that he could get a shower. And, and Lee said, yeah, they're called fallopian tube. <laughs> and, he, and he said, I remember it. He sent them over to uh, Janine and Caroline, the two girls that worked on reception, and asked, <laughs> asked them if he could borrow their fallopian tube so he could have a shower. I was like, yeah. oh, oh, that was hilarious. I remember that. I remember it well. I remember <laughs> it well. I can still picture him to, the, to this day. Yeah, I can. <laughs> he, was such a yeah. Canny, he was such a canny lad. Like, he was, like, brand new. Like, he was, it was as if it was his first day on planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's like, well, welcome to the gentle hazing of holiday park life. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, no, I remember. I do now. You you mentioned fallopian tubes. I remember that well. Uh, so if you are listening, Steve, you're very welcome for learning what fallopian tubes were at an early stage. He's probably a company director now. <laughs> <laughs> but he probably makes them. <laughs> he probably does. Yeah. <laughs> Although I've got to jump in here and say he's probably not the first or the last that ever got his hands on a pair of fallopian tubes on his first day at working for a holiday park in the UK. Uh, swiftly moving on. Uh, right, so I've got a question here for you that we're kind of touching on, telling a few stories. Have you got some fond memories? Have you got any stories that you might want to share with us about your time on the holiday parks, Lee? Do you know what? I've got so many good memories. I mean, we alluded to it before we started recording, but Ross, me and you, with the, the, the wrestling matches we used to have outside, um, I know we were both really into our wrestling back then. I, I still am. Yes. And by I the looks of your top, you still are. I'm, I'm um, rocking the Macho Man Randy Savage vest today. Absolutely, Definitely. yeah. Especially because I knew you um, But yeah, we used, I should have put, I've got loads of wrestling t-shirts in my drawer. I should have put one on. But no, we used to have some um, some wrestling matches outside outside the sheds. I think one day we, we actually went as far as um, put, or attempting to put a promo together. 
yeah. and we were going to actually edit it in the um, the editing suite. That's right. There was like a studio that were ha- that were had in the entertainment block that was sort of uh, in the entertainment office, and it was set up where you could have like it had a green screen and you could do it had an editing suite, and like at the time that was something that I thought that completely blew my mind that there was somewhere you could like make and produce and edit videos and put out like a live TV show every day. That was like, I, I, when we talk about like expectations versus reality of the job, there's certain things that I was not expecting at all, that, like in a negative way, but there was other things that completely like blew me mind in like a, wow, oh my God, I would never think that was possible kind of way as well. It was a really good setup for, for that kind of time, that era. It was you know, quite advanced, I think. Oh, it was well, just to put it out there, why, why, why don't you um, both have a match? You know, I can ref. <laughs> I've got a strikey top. Listen, after lockdown, let's do it. Oh, it, let, well, I'll, cut, <laughs> I'll cut a promo now, brother. <laughs> the macho man that's running wild. Yeah. Brilliant. But yeah, no, we had some, I had some great memories there. That, you know, the, the, the wrestling kind of stuff being, being one of them. Lee, I remember you in your Ali G outfit. Um, <laughs> That was that was fantastic. I think um, you and was it Chris the photographer? Yeah, yeah, Chris photographer. Yeah. You used to um, kind of go around entertaining the guests and that. Um, but the, the kind of overriding memory for me is just how close you became to people because you, you you're living with them, you're working with them on a daily basis, and they become your family. Um, I agree more. I'm yeah, really, and... I'm really glad you described it that way, actually, Lee, because we we had a, 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 we've had a few conversations previous to this, and everybody said the same thing, and I, f- I feel like we've almost slipped back into that feeling just dead naturally in this conversation. How we were all similar ages, we all came from different backgrounds, all different areas of the country, and we're all doing different jobs in different departments, but we're all had each other's back, we all looked after each other, we all looked out for each other. If one person had something in abundance, they were happy to give it to somebody that didn't have it. Everybody shared, everybody took care of each other and it was just such an awesome family experience. And that bubble that we lived in inside of the holiday park is something that would make me recommend somebody asking me about, oh, should I go for a job at the holiday park? Should I do this? I I fully, highly recommend it to anybody who's got that kind of mindset that they might be inclined to go and try that as a job. Go and do it. Yeah. Because honestly, as an experience, you'll need friends for life and have just an absolute blast. 100%. I mean, when I joined, I was yeah, 18, 19 at the time, and I was quite, I was quite shy. Um, so it took me a couple of months to kind of get into the swing of things. But if anyone is thinking about doing it and have got any doubts, just do it. Just do it. It's, it's you know, one of the best experiences that I've had. Looking back on, so when you were 18 then, looking, looking mm. back from where you are now, what advice would you give to yourself, your 18-year-old you? So I think, I don't know, it's tough really. I think it, it, it kind of depends what sort of personality type that person is. But if I was giving me some advice as an 18-year-old, just, just come out of your shell quicker. Just come out of your shell, get to know people, mingle, um, and then life just becomes a lot easier for you then. I remember you because we discussed this like on your the first time when you arrived at the park in Blackpool. Just go and introduce yourself to the staff. They're all drinking in the pub on the site. Just go and say hello. I've always thought of you as quite happy go lucky, a confident person. And I don't know if it's that whole Mancunian thing that you've got, but you've always had like that kind of vibe about you, where that wouldn't really swagger with you. Swagger. Yeah. That that would have t- like I I felt like I was quite a confident guy. But that kind of terrified me, the thought of just going over and introducing myself to people at the age of 19, starting a new job. But everybody was in the same boat, and I think that's the same for everyone. So coming out of your shell quicker, I think for a shy person, if you were quite a shy person when you started, you certainly weren't a shy person after a couple of months. So I think that's good advice. It did me the world, did me the world of good. It really did. And like I said, people become your family. I've got one. I've got another memory that really, really stands out. Oh yeah, go for apologies it. if 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 I'm not able to mention names, but edit it out if you need to. Yeah, no, so, go for it. We we'll um, love, we'll love it. We we'll love you mentioning <laughs> names. <laughs> Let's get some so, people in trouble. <laughs> we never used to. We never used to lock our doors when we were living on on site. Never, because you, you trusted everyone. And I remember one day, um, you were involved in this, Ross. Uh, mm-hmm. I woke up to a frog splash from, I think it was Zach Zodiac. 
<laughs> who would at the time been about 10 years old. Yeah. Like, what is this? If, brilliant, if, absolutely brilliant. If anybody doesn't know the name Zach Zodiac, okay, so on the UK wrestling circuit, there's a family called the Knight family. And if anybody follows um, wrestling like on a worldwide scale, um, the, there's a WWE female wrestler called Paige who belongs to our family. She's had huge success over in America and been a multiple time women's champion. There was actually a movie called Fighting With My Family that was produced by Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Stephen Merchant that came out last year all about their life. And Zach Zodiac uh, and Paige, their story, that's what the movie's all about, about their family. They were the wrestling company that came and worked at the park that we were all at and we had a great time getting to know with them. Lovely bunch of guys. And uh, yeah, the younger, the little brother, he's not so little now, he's about six foot five and about 18 stone. But uh, back then when he was just a young nipper, he was uh, always hanging around with us and always hanging around with me because I used to MC the wrestling events. And of course, Lee being a huge wrestling fan, we thought of a good way to wake him up one morning. And uh, it was a nice frog. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. But it's things like that that you remember. You remember. It was if great. He, he'd probably kill you if he give you a frog splash now. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. And Lee, so, I, remember, uh, I remember you had uh, a bit of a Mohican at one point. Oh, yeah, we talked about this as well, because um, <laughs> I was made to shave it off. That's right, yeah. That's right, that's right. It's Ross designing my hairstyles, you know, fresh out of um, hairdressing. He thought he'd give me a, a more weekend to follow David Beckham. God, yeah, I forgot. You used to cut hair, didn't you? I Ross? did, yeah, I did. Yeah, I remember that. The, give me a few trims. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, it was de- it was actually a dead handy skill to have, and uh, mm. I think it helped as an icebreaker with the lads. If any of the lads wanted a haircut, they just pop round, and it actually helped us get to know a few lads from other departments. I mean, obviously, me and me and you, Lee, live next door to each other, so we kind of got to know each other very quickly by default, and within within minutes, we realised we had an instant it's sort of kin- kindred spirits, if you like, because because of our love for for wrestling. Um, yeah, obviously, it's continued through Absolutely. Both, both of our lives. Um, so the the whole hairdressing scenario was something that I did. I had to do that because I wanted to go and do stage school and go to London and go down the whole West End route. But my parents were like, uh, at that point, it was like, uh, and it still is incredibly expensive to do that and sort of follow that dream. Um, and you never guaranteed a job at yeah. the end of it, obviously. So they they were really keen on me to go and get a trade under my belt before I sort of pursued my dream of, of, of being a performer. And hairdressing, uh, it just happened to be a family friend was opening a salon and said that I can get you through like a two year qualification in one year. And I managed to do the qualification in like 10 months and then went back to my parents and said, can I go to London now? And they went, uh, no, we still can't afford it. We just thought that we might have put you off for a year. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how I ended up going and auditioning to work on the holiday parks. But best, best decision I ever made. Like I would not change that for the world. I wouldn't. Not at all. Not at all. And you know, the, the banter you used to have as well. You know, there was t- the times I'd walk back into my shed and my bed would be upside down or up against the wall. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. Like you know, just just a good crack. It really was. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> you you possibly were responsible for one of them. Lee. I honestly think <laughs> Lee was probably responsible for most of the the sort of gentle hazing that went on. He was always a prankster. Like I always remember, like you saying about your bed being upside down and things like that. I, I remember like coming back to my shed once, and and me and Jamie was Jamie was my roommate on my shed mate. We had to share a shed. And I remember coming back once and, and Jamie had the big room, which was like the living room sort of shared communal area, kitchen, all that kind of thing. I had the smaller room at the back that had a door on. So Lee and I, maybe a couple of other members of staff probably helped him out. You might have been involved in this, actually. Uh, it came <laughs> into my room, took all of my furniture and belongings out of my room and set it up on the grass on the floor outside. Brilliant. <laughs> I, I just came back thinking, Oh, but, like it's been such a long day. I, I can't be asked with this. Like, but looking back on it, at the time I was so fucking annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> but then, in in like you know, putting everything back in my room. And to be fair, Lee did help us. Um, I think a couple of the lads helped us put my stuff back. It was just everybody wanted to just do something funny for a laugh because we didn't have social yeah. media. We weren't glued to our smartphones or our tablets. We weren't doing a million and one other things all the time. We actually just 
came up with funny shit to entertain ourselves and each other. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a do lot you of that. Both, uh, remember, do you both remember the PlayStation nights we used to have? Oh, yeah, yeah. we do. And the Weakest Link. The Weakest and, Link. Yeah, we, that's it. Weakest Link. And Russ. <laughs> used to, wow, he used to spit his dummy out. Uh, that is so funny, right? Because actually, we, we, um, we had Russ booked to be a guest on the show this morning to do his podcast episode. And that was one of the subjects that we were going to talk about with him. So we haven't got a definitive answer as to why he used to throw his uh, toys out the pram and go and take his beard at oars. And <laughs> <laughs> we think it was to do with oh. ta- tactical vote-offs. <laughs> yeah, oh, it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I remember them well. We had some good nights. Really, really good nights. But we're going to we'll ask him all about that when we get a chance to speak to him. I think we're going to try and do this uh, his episode tomorrow. Um, so okay. we'll, we're definitely going to ask him directly about that because that was some of the funniest things, I, like funniest shit I've ever seen. Then weakest link night. Oh, brilliant. So Lee, Lee would reminded me actually because I'd forgot about this, but everybody would sort of chip in a few quid, and whoever's day off it was would go and do a beer run. So we'd have them little sort of stubbies, yeah. I think they call them, then beer doors, and we'd all put a few quid in. So that was sort of the drink kitty for the night, and it. If, if, if Russ had yeah. got to the final, I think Russ was quite a good player. He had quite good general knowledge, so he would always end up like there or thereabouts towards the end. And if he was tactically voted off, he would absolutely lose his rag. <laughs> so yeah. be honest with us, Lee, did you ever tactically <laughs> vote him off on purpose? I'm sure I probably did on one or two occasions. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I'm, I used to like Russ. He, he's such a good lad. He was probably the most mank person that i've ever come across in my life lovely yeah. lovely guy lovely guy i can't remember if he was united or city though i think he was united, united. wasn't he yeah or, united or, or is united yeah yeah, yeah. oh don't we'll have him storming off if he says a city fan he'll be taking his bare doors with him <laughs> your city aren't you lee yeah i'm city yeah your city yeah 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 no good good days good times uh, and that's the end of the football discussion from the sunderland fan <laughs> so and what's your life been like after the holiday patch? You spent quite a number of years on there. So what, what followed for you in, in terms well, of work? Well, it, uh, it took me a while to adjust when I left the holiday park. You know, I loved it so much. But um, I think the, the reason I left is because I was missing home. But then when I came home, I wanted to be back. I mm. thought, no, nah, I'm going to you know, stick it out. I'm going to stay in Carpentry now. So um, as I said, I worked for uh, a travel company for 10 years. Um, which was really really good great industry to work in and then in 2013 married my wife Claire Um, and then in 2015 I was made redundant from the travel company and I've been working at Eon ever since which are obviously a a gas and electric company Um, so such a completely different industry but yeah it's good I enjoy it watching a lot of football season ticket holder at Coventry or Birmingham, as it has been for the last season. Yeah. Um, so yeah, life, life's pretty good at the minute. So, oh, so married, settled down, living back in your hometown, still a massive Coventry fan, uh, enjoying life, doing, yeah. doing perfectly normal job. You haven't been affected or completely, your life hasn't been ruined by working on a holiday park. There's no such thing as a holiday park curse. Like I've heard a lot of people talk about this, about life after holiday parks. It's very difficult to adjust. People, you know, almost liken it to, you know, the movie The Shawshank Redemption. They talk about people getting institutionalised because yeah. they've done the same thing. It's absolute nonsense. I don't believe in it whatsoever. I think it's all down to the individual. Uh, and I think... Um, I, I obviously wasn't a huge transition. I think the only transition for me going from my job working on a holiday park to going out and being a travelling gig and entertainer is that I don't live on a holiday park now. Um, I think a lot of people sort of just make that excuse that actually it's too hard to adjust and to go back because um, they're, they're probably a little bit afraid to go and tackle real life because you do find it's a bit of a bubble and it is some somewhat of an adjustment to come out of that but I think the only thing and, and you just touched on it there you were homesick and stuff and then when you came home you wanted to go back I think you probably wanted to go back and the, the reason that you wanted to go back was not because of the job it was because of the people I think people get attached to people when it comes to the, the holiday park life 100% Hundred percent. Yeah, you know, I've, I I met people during my time 
on, on the holiday park that I'd like to think I'll keep in touch with for the rest of my life. Like, you know, both of you two. Um, yeah, I'd highly recommend it to anyone. Yeah. Great. It's, it was really, really good five years for me. And, and do you think your biggest skill was you learned from your employment in the British holiday park? <clears throat> well, probably managing a team, actually, because that was my first managerial role. Um, and I was only I think, 21 at the time. Um, so it was a really, really big responsibility. And I wasn't quite sure how people would take me um, because I was their colleague to start with um, and then was promoted to being their manager. Um, so probably the managerial side. So the, the jobs I've done since then have been managing teams, uh, well, certainly for the last 12 years anyway. And do you know what? Just, just people skills as well interacting with the public i used to love that that's one of the things that i really really miss because you you kind of face-to-face -face conversations with people um whereas in my job now i don't have uh, interaction with the public so that was a really really positive side for me yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you you know i learned the similar skills you know we're dealing in volume and you're dealing with you know when things don't go the way expected you're dealing with the complaint side of it and finding a resolution so you know it, it sets you up nicely for a management position on outside world. I think honestly, like when when you talk about dealing with the public and, and the skills that you that you obviously still use, everybody uses skills that they learn from so, sort of these kind of early jobs and early working experiences. I've gone on to use like my the skills that I learned every single day in my in my current life or in my current job or certainly my job before like I, I had to retire because of the yeah. coronavirus. Um, <laughs> but like. I'm talking every different type of person, personality from different age groups, different walks of life, different social, economic backgrounds. You would literally meet people from every walk of life that would come to them holiday parks and have their holidays. And you'd be responsible for their enjoyment, their fun, their experience, their children's experiences. And not just that, but like the safety as well and things like that. It was quite a responsible yeah. job. Your, your job, and, and well, the two of you actually probably had more, more responsible jobs than say somebody like me that was on the entertainment did all we had to do was sort of babysit them of an evening where you were sort of yeah. hands-on with them families and them kids all throughout the day doing i was supervising various... 12 kids with their rifles in their hands <laughs> yeah so scary like big responsibility but everybody just managed to step up to the plate and everybody did a really good job and i think if would if we'd have been older I think if you get a guy in his 30s doing that type of job, they'll probably see it from like a more mature standpoint and be a bit more um, hesitant as in getting themselves in a situation where there could be like risks like that involved, where when you're young guys, yeah. you're just totally fearless. You do the job and you do it properly and you did it, and you both did it to a great standard, obviously. I mean, but were you never like terrified that, oh Christ, if something goes wrong here, there's going to be like an arrow sticking out of some kid's head or I'm going to, some kid's going to run over yeah. somebody with a quad bike or something. That's it. We used to, you used to live each day as it came. Like, you know, that my wages back then were purely for going out. Yeah. That's it, going out, having a good time. It was, it was great. Can you remember what your first wage was? Yeah, I think it was uh, about £83. Wow. Amazing. For the week. Wow. But do you know what? Back then, that, that, that wasn't too bad. That went pretty far. Yeah, my, I, I, I started about four years after you, so I started in 2000. No, sorry, I started Christmas 2001. And my first wage after, after everything had been taken off was like 105 quid. And I thought that was like a million pound a week. Yeah. That's what it felt yeah. like. Because it was. Yeah. Somebody's going to pay me 100 pound a week to do this job. That is like insane. And now yeah. we're on the subject of um, going out. Did you ever go over to like the entertainment venues and see some of the cabarets that were on and some of the yeah. shows? Yeah, so um, all the time. But the one that really stands out for me is Ken Webster. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Hypnotist. He was absolutely fantastic. I think he still does a show um, yeah. in Blackpool. Yeah, he does. He does. Do you know he... Um, yeah. He's done some big stuff as well, you know. He, he had a, a show at the at the Pleasure Beach for years and years and years. But he did, he's done like Robbie Williams' birthday party and stuff like that. He is absolutely amazing. So uh, you, you can find him online. Actually, you can find Ken on Facebook. It's Ken Webster, comedy hypnotist. 
Uh, he's got stuff available. I think he's got merchandise. You can go and check him out. He's probably got a YouTube channel, I'm sure, and probably a website. So, Ken Webster, big shout out for you. Uh, if you're listening, uh, if anybody that's listening hasn't seen Ken's stuff before, go check him out. Ken Webster, comedy hypnotist. That's a good, that's a great shout, that Lee. I haven't seen his show for he years. He was fantastic. Oh, superb. Really, really good. Um, really entertaining. Um, good laugh. Recommend it to anyone. Another one that stands out for me is Fox. Probably oh, more for the ladies, but it really stands out. It really, really stands out as uh, as a, um, a an act that we used to have on the site. That that's so funny because like how how things like intertwine, how lives intertwine. So Fox was owned by two guys called both called John. Incidentally, it's a bit like this interview, <laughs> but two Johns instead of two Lee. <laughs> uh, and John Adair, who was the drummer. And, and co-owner of Fox. His son, Alex Adair, designs all of my um, promo material, all of my posters wow. and logos and stuff now. So, I, but I see, I see John still quite regularly uh, and Fox were a fantastic band. I actually joined their, the, the sort of boys onto their Westlife. I joined an act called Nail Order who were like another okay. sort of sim- <laughs> similar type of, type of act, sort of an all-singing, all-dancing mm. boy band. But yeah, Fox was yeah. absolutely phenomenal, had a great reputation. And uh, I think all of the, the, the lads that were in Fox are still out uh, gigging and stuff now, um, yeah. doing their own things. So yeah, that, that, was a, that was definitely one for the ladies, but that, that to me was the type of band that I wanted to be in. Yeah, yeah. They were, ta- they were really talented as well, really talented. A- absolutely phenomenal. Really yeah. good. In terms of um, the in-house entertainment, Ian the Goat, he was fantastic. Ian the Goat, Ian yeah. the Goat. He was uh, like yeah. host and compare, and he used to yeah. do. Um, he used to do like a lunchtime. He used to call it Goat's Lunchbox, actually, and he'd do like. An <laughs> That's <afternoon>. right. <laughs> he'd do like an afternoon of entertainment in in the pub that was on site that we all used to go for a beer at. After hours, we'd, we'd go for a beer, and he during the daytime he would do like an event there, and he'd have. God, like cine racing, stand-up bingo, games of hoy. If anybody doesn't know what hoy is, well, I'll give you a brief description of the game of hoy. Okay, so the, the, the dealer or the caller has got a set of playing cards and you, all the people that want to play, pay their pound or whatever it is. And uh, they get like a, a wooden board and on the wooden board is nine different playing cards. Uh, and you've basically got to cover the playing cards if the dealer calls out your your card and you have it on your board it's basically like bingo with a pack of playing cards uh, and we used to have yeah well i had loads of games of that we'd do karaoke in there and he would always have an assistant actually he would always have like one of the entertainment team with him as, as his assistant and that assistant on that day if you were on goat's lunchbox you would guarantee you were going to get absolutely rinsed by him <laughs> <laughs> can Good i just times. say though i'm really really shocked that out of the three Four mentioned cabarets. You've not put a wrestling one in there. Oh well, re- <laughs> wrestling. Wrestling is art meets meets real life. That you couldn't really call it a cabaret. It's it's more like a religion, dude. <laughs> yeah, do you know what? I used to love. I used to love the wrestling. And Ross, I remember you getting involved quite a bit. I remember one distinctly where um, you uh, you hit the people's elbow on uh, on one of the wrestlers in the uh, in one of the inst- entertainment venues. Yeah, brilliant. I also, I, also used to, uh, I also used to hit them with the Ross bottom every now and then. <laughs> that's right, yeah, 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 that's right. I remember now, I remember. Many that's people have been hit by the Ross bottom. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, good, uh, brilliant, brilliant times, brilliant they, times. They, they were so gracious, the fact that they were like a, a profession, and still are now, you know, one of the biggest and well-respected and certainly most well-known, uh, like, wrestling companies in the UK and they produce some brilliant stuff. Um, so it's WAW, it's World Association Wrestling, if you, if you want to go and check them out. If there's any wrestling fans, listen, Ricky Knight and his family, the Knight family, they were so gracious and so kind to me, knowing that I was a huge wrestling fan. And they got me involved in the show every week. And for me, for a young kid that wanted to be in singing and dancing and entertainment, but happened to love wrestling, that was just like icing on the cake. I never thought for one minute that I'd get to participate, not participate in matches, but like get in the ring and sort of, you know, throw a few moves and they'd be so cool with us. Like, that was just absolute dream come true for me. Like, as a young sort of 19-year-old lad, I never would have thought that that could, could happen. 
So uh, it was it was like checking a checking a a, a bucket list, a big ticket on a bucket list sort of dream. Who gets to do that? Come to work and flip and do wrestling moves on people and get paid. Well, obviously wrestlers do, but you did it quite well actually as well. You did it. You you did it pretty well. The the, uh, the people's elbow and the Ross bottom. Well, I had a lot of practice with our matches, obviously. I, I mean, we. Yeah. I think we probably yeah destroyed more furniture. <laughs> For those of us who uh, who are, I don't know if it's ignorant or or just unknowledgeable in this area, what is a Ross bottom? Please well, explain. well, the the rock. Do you want to take that one, Ross? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's dead simple. So the 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 rock, obviously Dwayne Johnson, the world's biggest flipping movie star now. Um, he his finishing move was called the rock bottom. Where I just adapted the that move as my own finisher and called it the Ross Bottom. So that's that's that that's that story for you in a nutshell. A dangerous and deadly move if performed correctly can incapacitate an opponent for a three count. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Do you chaps remember the uh, the two thousand and two World Cup? Oh yeah. We- that's I remember what... watching that in the uh, in the pub on site when we uh, got knocked out. I think it was by Brazil, and uh, the head lifeguard at that time, I think his name was Wade. Uh, I've never seen anyone cry so much at a football match. Oh my it was I just I couldn't believe it. <laughs> this is the thing, right? Anything like that, like the World Cup, is a massive deal. Every department on that holiday park went above and beyond what anybody would be expected to do to make that a, a proper carnival atmosphere. And when, when England were playing, oh my God, it was like, it was absolute bedlam, but it was so cool. It was such a good atmosphere. I, I think everybody that worked there was really good at, at doing stuff like that, like pulling, everybody pulling together to do something like big for like a big occasion. Like I used to love stuff like that. Because the games were like six, seven in the morning as well, weren't yeah. they? Because it was in it Japan. Was. Yeah. I remember, I remember on our days off, a few of us had days off, going into Blackpool and going to watch a couple of the games and you could go and get like a, a bacon sandwich and a pint at like seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Face painted and scarf round your neck, yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. Brannigan's, used to go to Brannigan's to watch a couple of the matches. Yeah. yeah. I've had, yeah I think that's gone now. When, I think it would have been about 2005, maybe. Um, the band that I was in at the time, we were resident, the resident band at the Blackpool Tower Lounge for two seasons. So I was there every Friday and Saturday throughout the season, performing like on the Friday afternoon, Friday evening, Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening. And every Friday night, we're in Brannigan's. Every Friday night without fail. It was absolutely jumping. Yeah. And, I, and I, yeah. I, I felt somewhat proud because obviously I'd been working in Blackpool and I knew that as, that was a place where we all used to have a night out. It was like, I think it might have been a, it was a Monday or a Wednesday night. We'd all go Brannigan's. Yeah. The, the place to be. And I always used to tell the lads in the band that I was working with, oh, come on, I'll take you to Brannigan's. That's where it's at. That's where all the VIPs go to Brannigan's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brannigan's. And then I think you had Cahoots next door Cahoots. or a couple of doors down. It was NTK. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Revolution with the see-through dance floor. Yes. That's right. Yeah. I remember Flair. that well. I remember flares, and I remember he- heaven and hell, or what I used to call it, heaven and fuck off and die. <laughs> <laughs> heaven and hell, God, yeah. The palace yeah. as well. Yeah. Oh, honestly, the, it, it's so funny because like all of these like venues and all these places, the, there's a DJ called uh, DJ Key. He's like a DJ in Blackpool, and he's been around for years. He was actually the resident DJ at the Tower Lounge in Blackpool when we were worked there. He was the manager of the palace nightclub when it first opened and he he had some hilarious stories about that um some good times so uh advice for candidates looking to start a career on british holiday parks now 2020 let's imagine we're off to fast forward about a year into the future i think but although i have heard this week that there's going to be some good news uh, about holiday parks reopening i don't think they're going to be reopening mm-hmm. full capacity and i think it's going to be some time till we see return to how it was before however uh what advice would you give to anybody starting to uh looking to start a career on the on the british holiday park scene now in 2020 take the plunge do it it can lead to so many more things so if that's something you're interested in absolutely go ahead and do it and then it could lead potentially to overseas repping 
um, which you know it's probably one regret that I've got, not going overseas to rep for at least a season. Um, so absolutely, just take the plunge. If you're thinking about doing it, do it. And utilise social media as well. Mm. You know, if you're like when it comes to your interview or whatnot, or if you're looking to get yourself, get your name out there, utilise your social media pages. Um, yeah. But it's the best experience that you could ever have. So I'd highly recommend it. Yeah, oh, me too. I can't, I can't speak highly enough about the experience. And I think they're so lucky nowadays. They're so spoiled. When we lived at the Holiday Park in Blackpool, we only knew the Holiday Park in Blackpool. We only knew the staff in Blackpool. Now, they're all like intrinsically connected via social media. They all know who's on the next park yeah. down the road. They all know who's, you know, 200 miles down the road. They all chat with each other. They're all friends. They've got the ability to share experiences and stories and techniques and procedures with one another, like in the blink of an eye, instantly. It's, it's instant now. Yeah. I could not have told you the name of one of the entertainment staff at the, the park in, say, North Wales. I, w I just wouldn't have known because we never would get the mix. You, it's just not something that would have happened then because obviously technology the way it is now it, it, everything's at the, in the palm of your hand like literally it, it's just so it's so much easier and so much more so many more advantages I was just going to say you've literally got the world in, in, in the palm of your hand now haven't you oh, you know I, so yeah, it's absolutely. just so easy to connect to people well, you, you just get all that information instantly like if we wanted to know let's say for example as, as a squad we decided five of us to go on a road trip to, to another holiday park down the road. We wouldn't know anybody there. We wouldn't know who we were going to meet. We wouldn't know anything about them. Now, all these yep. teams can kind of integrate with each other and share information, like I said, in an instant. It's just so much easier. Um, would, would I'm so yeah. glad we did it when we did it, when there was no social media and accessibility to other sites. I, I think 100%, 100%. I enjoyed my time more with it. I think if we did it now, we wouldn't have... The enjoyable time that we had back then. I, I think you'd find enjoyment in other ways. I just think it was it's probably a little bit more, I don't want to say of a lonelier experience, but people have become sort of generally more independent and a bit, in, in, not introverted, but they're just more happy with their own company. Yeah, I think, you know, I probably should have rephrased that. I think if someone was to do it now, absolutely, you'll have the time of your life. Um, I think, as Lee said, in kind of 98 to 2003, you know, we didn't have the social media. We weren't tempted to just stay in on, a, on an evening. You'd go out, um, but now you've got the social media, you might be kind of drawn to doing other things, but absolutely recommend it. It's, it's, it's going to a holiday, working at a holiday park. It's fantastic. Yeah, you can sit and watch Netflix two nights a week, but the other five, get yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> You were working on the holiday parks for five seasons and you went straight into the, the, the tourism industry and you worked for a huge holiday company. What, was it literally an easy decision? To, did you go, well, listen, I've got this experience working on holiday parks. This is a great industry to be in. Was that like an easy transition and did it make sense like coming from the job that you had and did it, the stuff that you learned working for the holiday park company, did that translate well into the job with your tourism? So there was probably about a two-year gap in that two years. I did some jobs that I didn't enjoy, um, but then I got an interview at the, at the travel company and it just suited me down to the ground. So as I said, I was there for 10 years. and Definitely some of the skills that I, I learned on, on the holiday park translated uh, or were transferable into to the, to the job with the travel company, absolutely. So I had to do a lot of interacting with customers, albeit over the phone. Um, but it was great because you're talking to customers about something that you enjoy mm. and something that they're going to enjoy, i.e. their holiday. If you had the chance to do it again, would you do it? 100%. No doubt about it. <laughs> oh, yeah, nice don't even, yeah, don't even need to ask that. I, those five seasons were absolutely superb. So, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, I'd be the same. I, I, I don't think anybody could change my mind either. I think it's a great thing for young people to do in terms of like your independence and things like that. Living independently at the age of 19 seems like quite a daunting, scary thing. But it was the best thing I ever did. Learning to stand on yeah. your two feet. That's it. You, you, you're in a position where you've got no choice but to learn quickly. So it does people the world mm. of good. 
Yeah, it really does. It certainly instilled a bit more self-confidence in me. And one of the things that I learned was not to be frightened to ask if there's something you don't know about. I think a lot of people like nowadays just go ahead and steamroll into things. You know, oh, I can do this, I can do that, I can do the other, without actually really knowing what they're doing. Well, actually, if you just open your mouth, <laughs> that's something that I learned. Yeah, that's quite, it. Quite yeah, early. you've got to. Definitely, you've got to. Got to if, you, if you're unsure, just ask the question. I was going to ask you a question, but this is for Lee. It's not for you, Ross. Go on. Um, so, if I'm going to write your life story, who's going to play you? Do you know what? I looked at that question and emailed it over. So it's going to have to be Simon Pegg. Look, I'll take my No way. Off. Now you see right. it. I don't see it. Look at the state <laughs> of this hair for a start. This is lockdown <laughs> hair. This is. But yeah, apparent, apparently Simon Pegg is my double. Yeah, obviously people uh, listening won't be able to see you, but we'll get a picture of you and we'll get a picture of Simon Pegg and put them side by side. <laughs> yeah, do it. <laughs> I was actually, it was about five years ago now, I was in, I was in Brighton uh, yes. visiting my dad. He lives down there. Uh, and we walked into a shop. I think it was a WH Smith's or something like that. Bought something, went up to the counter, and the chap said, has anyone told you you look like David Moyes? I was like, what? <laughs> no. David Moyes? David Moyes. Like literally no if one's David ever said Moyes that. looked like Simon Pegg then I could understand well <laughs> yeah exactly it's like no mate no not at all but yeah so, I'd, go with, I'd go with Simon Pegg so last week I went to a seafood disco and pulled a muscle so now I've stuck <laughs> my joke of the day let me hear yours Lee <laughs> okay go on then so um, what noise does a cow with no lips make don't know what noise does know. a cow with no lips make Ooh. <laughs> wow. We've arrived. <laughs> and I will be stealing that one. That's going straight in the dad joke collection. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't what it? What do you mean? I've just took notes of that. <laughs> I can't remember where I heard that, but it's resonated ever since I heard it. And I always pull that one out of the bag if I'm stuck for a joke. Nice. So, um, in terms of like working on the holiday parks, obviously we've had a good catch up. We've talked about a lot of stuff. We've talked about the years that you spent there, the job that you did, how you started out, uh, all the friends that you've made. In terms of positive influences and friends sort of from your holiday park career, um, is there anybody that sort of sticks out for anything they did for you, anything that they helped you with that you've carried with you through life or just any sort of positive influences that you might have had? Yeah, so I think in terms of like a mentor for the, the roles that I'm doing now, that managerial roles, uh, Lindsay, who she was on the uh, the leisure team when I joined, but then she moved to manage the personnel department. Yeah. Uh, she was absolutely fantastic. Still, um, I've got Lindsay as a friend on Facebook. Um, she was a real positive influence. <clears throat> and, you know, I'd like to say that she'll be a friend for, for, for life as well. Um and you know, not just because you guys are here. You guys, you know, I consider I consider good friends, and would like to keep in touch with going forward. So yeah, great. Uh, did you did you send him the twenty quid there, Lee? I did. Yeah, <laughs> I used your PayPal though. Right. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Twenty quid, well spent. <laughs> and just just a quick one though, before we do close this off, I mm -hmm. learned something very new because every day is a school day. Go on. And we can edit this out if you don't want it on. But I've heard. Like you are related to some pop star royalty. <laughs> yeah, so um, you don't need to register it out, it's fine. Uh, my dad was responsible for uh, we going to Barbados in, 19, in 1975, which spent two weeks at number one. Uh, and then in 1999, Venga Boys covered it with We're Going to Ibiza. So he was chuffed to bits when that hit number one as well. So yeah, yeah, um, it's an interesting uh, little tidbit there. Yeah, I see. How come I've only just found this out? Well, I'm, I'm sure you knew, Lee. I told him. I told him about this. I was like, "Oh, it'd be so cool because when when we get Lee on, we'll be able to chat and, and, and ask him about the fact that his dad had like a huge hit." And he was like, "What? No, yeah. no, no one told me about no music. No, we didn't know nothing about that." <laughs> 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 so yeah, um, he also produced uh, Starship Trooper for Sarah Brightman and Pop Gossip, which was a hit in the same year. I think that was like number four hit. So yeah, 
that's kind of my claim to fame. Awesome. Absolutely wow. awesome. I bet you must have been disappointed when you said, oh, I'm going to Blackpool. <laughs> <laughs> he was gutted. He was gutted. Right. But no, we had a great time. So yeah, mixing with the celebs right here on the Macam and the Bank Holiday Park Life. Lee, it's been absolutely great to have you on. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and thanks for catching up with us. We'd love to have you on again sometime down the line. So um, make sure you stay around and we'll definitely keep in touch. And uh, I think we're... It's safe to say we were great friends uh, and we've slipped back into the old banter straight away. It's been great catching up with yeah. you and talking with you. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. We'd love to do it again sometime if you wouldn't mind coming back. No worries. It's been a pleasure both and great to, great to talk to you as well. I think we should definitely come back after um, I arrange this celebrity wrestling match between Let's the sort it. Let's sort it. Do it. Let's get Let's it. Let's sort it. No problem. Awesome. Let's get it on. We'll meet at a midway point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's brilliant. been really, really nice, and thanks, thanks for uh, inviting me. Really nice of you both. Oh, absolute pleasure, mate. We'll, uh, we'll I think what we'll do is uh, after we get Russ on, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can have like a weakest link night, and we'll try and get the quiz going and get everybody on. <laughs> weakest link on Zoom. Sounds great. Let's make it happen. Sounds good. Sounds good. All ah, right. Man. Just remember to keep your doors locked because I might rearrange your rooms while we're on it. <laughs> <laughs> So we've had a great time. Thank you so much to our guest, Lee Hughes, for chatting to us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I knew we'd have a good conversation. It was like putting on an old comfortable pair of slacks. A lovely time to catch up uh, and a great bit of insight about Lee's life uh, before, during and after his Holiday Park journey. This has been Holiday Park Life. You've been listening to The Mackham and The Mank. Me, Ross The Mackham and Lee The Mank. It's time for us to say goodnight. And we'll see you next time. Heidi high and fan dabby trousers. Keep your hats on. Bye for now. Bye for now. So that was our very first interview guest, our old pal, Lee Hughes. Uh, a really informative, really fun, really uh, nice to catch up with him as well, Lee, after all them years, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was just like talking to him as if he was in the room yesterday. Even though now we think he looks like Simon Pegg. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that was great fun. But uh, yeah, a huge thanks to our guest, Lee Hughes, for taking time out of his, uh, out of his schedule and speaking to us. Uh, and I think something that I take from all, all of the chats that we're going to be having and Lee being our first guest, it was great to hear him talk so positively and speak so highly about his experiences in holiday parks. Yeah, and it just re replicates what we've been going on about for all these years of how good it was and the experiences and the friendships you've made over there. Yeah, definitely. Well, listen, thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Lee. It's been a pleasure as always. Great to talk to you, mate. Yeah, definitely. Hey, listen, we're going to catch you down the road, guys. Stay safe out there. Take care of each other. And we'll see you very, very soon on another episode of Holiday Park Life with the Mackham and the Mank. Take care and bye for now. Bye. <laughs>